Now, how is everyone today? <laughs> Good. Okay, a lively bunch of math majors. Kind of surprised every time. So, uh, there's a quiz running. It's due Saturday at the close of business of the testing center, which, don't, don't quote me on this, but I think that's like noon or something. Any, any, any questions, logistical questions about that? This is the first that we're, I mean, I know it's the way you it's the, it is the first this quiz. Is the, the first, the first person is canceled. Yeah. Very good. Other questions? Yes? It is a paper exam. It'll be just like doing a written homework. Yes? So, shh. I'm sorry? Well, the close of business of the testing center. So, everybody should have already signed up for a seat. So if you haven't done that, that's not good, right? Because because what what if you wait until Friday because you just really have it your heart set for Saturday and there's no seats available on Saturday? That wouldn't be good. Other questions? Okay, so last time, last time we had we had just started to talk um, about uh, vectors. So let's make uh, let's make a certain let's start that remark over again. Focus. Is it out of focus? Oh, it's out of focus. We we had talked about vectors, but we were talking about the signed size of objects. Come on, thingy. What, it always wants to do two. Do, do one. Do just one. Good. Okay. So, uh, in R1, that is to say, the line, uh, the way that we draw the line is like so. Always take the convention. It, it is almost always the convention that to the right is the increasing direction. And the way that you signify that in any case is with the, with the arrow. Okay, so now, um, if we have the origin here, if we have the origin here, then we call points on the right side positive and points on the left side negative, so that if you were to take, if you were to take, um, if you were to measure a value right there, then you could measure the distance to the origin and suppose that turned out to be 5, then what's the name for this point? Positive 5. Okay. Whereas if you <clears throat> measure a point over here and the distance to the origin turns out to be, say, 6, then what's the name for that point? Negative, Negative 6. Okay, because, because what we're considering, we're considering these points to actually be little, little arrows. So this one, this little arrow is pointing in the same sense as, our, as, as the underlying space. So that's why it's construed as being positive. It has length 5 or whatever I said it was, and it's called positive 5 because it's pointing in the same sense as the underlying space. This one, supposing that it has length uh, eight or whatever I, I said it was a second ago. If that has length eight, then we're going to call this negative eight because that arrow is pointing in the opposite sense of, uh, of the space. And this is true. These are, these are increments, which is to say you could take this and move it way over here. It would still have length five and it would still be positive five if you were to move this, this whole increment over here. Okay. So, good. Uh, the size, suppose that we choose an x, any x, that's some x value, then the, the formula, which tells you the, the uh, size of the x, but without the orientation, without the, without the sign, is, in the first place, denoted it as absolute value x. And of course, there's that piecewise formula, that is to say, absolute value of x is, 
is x when x is greater or equal to zero and it's negative x when x is less than zero, but I'm going to use a different formula. I'm going to use this formula. Which is to say, the way that you get the the way that you get the size of x is you first square it and, and then you take the square root of the result. So, for example, if I were to give you the number positive 5, what's the square of positive 5? 25, and the square root of that? 5. Okay, because of course when we say square root, we mean the unique positive semi-definite square root. That is to say, it is, it is incorrect to say that the square root of 25 is plus or minus 5. No, the square root of 25 is 5. Okay, suppose, suppose that I give you the number negative 8. What is the square of negative 8? 64. And the square root of 64? 8. So, this, this definition of absolute value works the same way as, as, as the other one that you're, that you're used to, but it looks maybe not the usual way. Okay, 2. Uh, in R2, of course, the orientation, or the, the, the drawing, is a plane. Okay, so then suppose that, suppose that uh, we have a point, a single point. Just that point right there. Uh, I'd like for you to observe that if we just draw the arrow going to that point and consider that to be an increment so that we could move that arrow around, notice that this arrow can have a length. We could get out a ruler and measure it. But it doesn't make any sense to say that that arrow has a signed length. Right? It doesn't make any sense to say that this, that this is, say, length positive 5 or negative 5. It doesn't make sense to distinguish in that way. Whereas it did make sense to distinguish these in that way. The reason why it cannot, it's not just that we haven't, we haven't come up with a way to distinguish it, it's that it cannot make a difference. Because consider if you had your eyeball right here and you were looking at it, that's my artist's impression of an eyeball, then it would look like it's increasing to the right. That, that, it, that, that, it, that, in, that it senses to the right. Okay, and then you might say, well, to me, right is always positive. Okay, well, what if you were, what if you were to walk around to the other side, make little, little footprints, I can't even do that. Th these are footprints, walking around to the other side. Okay, walk around to the other side and look at it from this direction. <clears throat> so now, to, for this observer, now it appears to be going to the left. Okay, so this, this, this thing that we've drawn does have, does have a, a, a length, but it doesn't have a, a, an oriented sense. Okay, so the, if, this, <coughs> if this is uh, vector x, so if we call that x, then we already know a, f a formula for the length of x. Okay, we know this one we know that the length of x is defined as what? We defined it last time or two times ago, I can't remember. Square root of? Good. The square root of x dot x. Okay, the square root of x dot x. But now I'm going to do something that's, still, that's a little weird. A little weird. Uh, of course, we define dot product in terms of transpose. So this is also the square root of x transpose x, right? Because after all, dot product can be defined with transposes. OK, so now I'm going to do some ultimate weirdness, and then I'm going to come export that weirdness to here. So uh, we briefly mentioned determinant last time, the determinant of a 2 by 2 matrix is the difference of the product of the diagonals, right? Y'all all know what I'm saying. Now, that's for a two by two matrix. So, what kind of matrices can you compute the determinant of? The square kind, right? 
So you could do it for two by two, you could do it for three by three, you could do it for 2451 by 2451, right? So I'd like for you to consider a scalar. Can a scalar be viewed as a matrix? Sure, right? What would be its rows and columns? <coughs> one and one. So, so, scalars are also square matrices. They are. It, it, it's, it's strange to think of them this, in, in such a way, but it is a fact. So, <coughs> what is the determinant of a, of a one by one matrix? Suppose I give you the, the, the one by one matrix eight. What's its determinant? It's eight. It's eight. The determinant of a scalar is itself. That's nice. So, x transpose x, what kind of thing is x transpose x? Is it a scalar or a vector? Scalar. It is a scalar. So, this is in fact equal to the absolute, the, the magnitude of x is the square root of the determinant of x transpose x. That works because x transpose x is a, is a scalar and just in, inserting that determinant does nothing. And I, I fully admit that that's a little bit weird looking, but I just need a few more minutes to, to make the point. Furthermore, considering x, uh, scalar x, uh, a scalar x can, can, as we just said, be interpreted as, as a one by one matrix. So what's the transpose of a scalar? Itself. Itself. So, like, what's the transpose of, say, 2451? 2451. As a result, as a result, this formula above can also be written as the square root of x transpose x, where transpose does nothing to a scalar. And furthermore, as a result, I can insert a determinant in there, so I'm going to. So uh, the determinant of x transpose x. So that's a little bit nice, isn't it? That the formula for the, the magnitude of a, of a, of a one-dimensional, of, of this kind of object is the same as the formula as this one. Okay, okay. These little one-dimensional things cannot have a, an orientation sense. But if you take two vectors at a time instead of just one, if you take two at a time instead of just one, so in particular, uh, oops, we'll take this, the standard basis vectors. So what are, what are our names for the standard basis vectors? E1 and E2. E1 and, E2. and I'm going to take them in that order. First, first the first one, then the second one. So if I draw first the first one, E1, E1, and then I draw E2, but I put the tail of E2 at the head of E1, then what this gives us, what this gives us, if we, if we imagine traveling backwards by E1 now and then, and then backwards by E2, this gives us the unit square, but it gives it to us in a certain orientation where you follow E1 first, then E2. And so this is the unit square oriented like so. That is to say, counterclockwise. Okay. So now, like in this case, how you can't, you can't give an orientation to this, the, re the intuitive reason why I said you can't orient it is because, well, on this side it looks like the one, and if you walk around to the other side, it looks like the other. Can you walk around to the other side if you have to stay in the plane? You, ha you have to imagine you're a two-dimensional creature now. You can't leave the plane. Is there, any is there any view that you could get of this so that it wouldn't look like it does? There's not. You can't, you can't get on the other side of it because you can't leave the page. Okay. You don't, you don't even have a head. You're, you're flat. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Yeah, you, you mentioned rotating planes and stuff, so I figured why not rotate you? 
so it, it won't work because that's not that's not a permissible. It's not in, it's not in the the universe of possible moves. Okay, so R R two looks like this. Now, if we briefly consider briefly consider a parallelogram, so I'll call this Y and this X. So a parallel, parallelogram with sides like so. Uh, this parallelogram, I'm not giving it an orientation. I'm not talking about its orientation yet. Not a, I'm not giving it a swirl yet. But what I do want to know, what I do want to know, is that notice that this is a uh, what am I trying to say? This point is a zero-dimensional object in a one-dimensional space. Okay? Or you can view it as a one-dimensional object in a one-dimensional space, if you look at it as an arrow. This one is a, is a one-dimensional object in a two-dimensional space. And, this, and it can't be viewed as a two-dimensional object, because it only has one direction you can travel. But this one, this is a two-dimensional object in a two-dimensional space. So it has an area in the same sense that all the little, these little things have area. How do you compute the area of this parallelogram? I, I don't, I, I agree with determinant. I don't, I don't have any idea what cross product is. In, in the first place, this is R2 which reveals that I was misle misleading you. <laughs> Cross products only defined in R3, right? Yeah. They say make the last one. Um, if you wanted to do it more geometrically, you could like, actually find the height and the base. And do that. Right, we could, we could take angles and, and height and all that. We could do that. But I want to get something that looks just like this. Okay. And multiply them together. Well, that would tell me that that would tell us the length of a rectangle that has this length and that length. But but x and y are not necessarily at right angles. Okay. So here's the surprising formula. It's a surprising formula. If we if we consider this object a thing in its own right, this little piece of parallelogram, its area its area is given as the square root of the determinant of x, y. So what I mean by square brackets x, y, I mean I'm making a, t I'm making a matrix. The first column is, is, is x and the second column is y. So, this, so what are the dimensions of this matrix? Two by two, because, because these vectors are in R2, and I have two columns. So this is a two by two matrix. X, Y, transpose X, Y. <coughs> That's the formula. That's the formula for the, for the area of a parallelogram. Interesting. Interesting. But... But it doesn't, it will not encode for us, it will not encode for us uh, whether or not, it won't encode for us the sign of the parallelogram, whether or not its, its orientation agrees or disagrees with the underlying space. Okay, so this is the unsigned area. Okay, which is to say it always gives you a non-negative number. Now, how do we compute the signed area of a parallelogram? A parallelogram that where you, you're actually following one edge first and then the other. So like this one, x and then y.
So supposing that this parallelogram is the exact same as that one, but we want its signed area, how do you compute its signed area? This is the last thing we said last time. That's right. So the signed area, signed area, is determinant of the matrix with columns X and Y. Then the sign, the sign of this will, is telling you whether or not the resulting uh, parallel, parallelogram agrees or disagrees with the sense of, of R2. So that is to say, in the case, in the case where you obtain a positive value for the determinant, if you obtain a positive value for the determinant, that means that if you were to draw X first and then Y, you draw X first and then Y, you would obtain a parallelogram that has the same sense as R2. That is to say, these two are in agreement. They're both counterclockwise. Both counterclockwise. OK. <clears throat> if, you, if you obtain a negative result from this determinant, that means that if you draw x first, because x is the first column, and then y. So see if you can draw x first and then y and make it to where uh, you have the, a different orientation. And, and to make it interesting, how about let's say that the, the, the x looks just like this. But you want to make it to where you have a clockwise orientation. Yeah. Y could be facing down-ish, down right? Something like this. Okay. <clears throat> so this one would have clockwise orientation. Okay, interesting. Very interesting. That's the case in, in, uh, in R2. What's the case in R3? Let's take a look at it. So in R3, in R3, of course, there's how many basis vectors? Three. And then we've got to do that isometric drawing thing that, that, that we always do, right? So uh, it looks like this. And then many students have difficulty remembering which axis is, is usually which. So if we, if we momentarily take the names x, y, and z, it, which, is, which is the common case in R3, almost everyone agrees about the z-axis. Which one is z? The one going up, right? That one is z. And then there's always confusion about, does everyone understands this drawing, right? So this, this one is coming out of the page. But I can't draw it coming directly at us because then we couldn't see it. Well, do you mean like when it's a two-dimensional drawing? No, well, I mean, no, but when it's three-dimensional drawing, I'm always trying to see all hang out as well. It might, be a, it might be a physics versus math thing. I'm not sure. I think it is, yeah. It might be physics versus math. Did you have a thing? Yeah, it's like the difference between looking at a table and the bottom is a paper lying on the table and Z is up off the table. Mm -hmm. Okay, but at, at any rate, let's momentarily take the convention that 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 the axes one, two, and three are are called x, y, and z, and the third one is going up. So my question to you is now: Where is where is x? Where is the first axis? Supposing that's the third axis, is it this one? No, it's this one, right? This is x. This is x, and then I guess 
by process of elimination, this one is y. So why, why can this one not be x? Because, because what? I heard it. The right hand rule, right? Because the basis is ordered. First, what, what's the name of the vector that's pointing in the, in, the, in the x direction? E1, and then the one pointing in this direction is E2, and then the one pointing in this direction is E3. So the, the convention, when you have it, the way you can tell you have it right is you put your fingers in the direction of the first coordinate direction. So your fingers are going this way. And you hold your fingers so that they would curl they would bend toward the second one, like, like so. And then your thumb is pointing in the direction of the third one. Okay, notice that, notice that if x were here, if x were here, I'd have to put my fingers like this because I'd want to curl to the other one, right, to, to y. And then my thumb would be pointing down in the opposite direction. Okay, so it's called the right-hand rule because first, second, third. Okay, and you can only do that with a physiologically normal right hand. <laughs> okay? You can't do it with your left hand. Similarly, this, this occurs in, 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 in other situations. If there was an electrical wire running from that side to that side, and there was a current flowing in that direction, then the direction of the electrical current is in the direction of my thumb. What is the direction of the magnetic field? In the direction of my fingers. Okay. Electrical current, magnetic field. Okay, right. That's how you tell uh, when you have it right. So any question about this? Okay, so now, suppose that we have some vector that's floating around in, th in three space. That's just a, a vector. Okay, does, it has a length. It has a length. Uh, if we call this vector x, then its length is the length of x, is that same formula that we had on the previous page. The determinant, uh, sorry, the square root of the determinant of x transpose x. Does it have a signed length? Does it have an orientation? No, because you, you could walk around to some other side and it would look like it's pointing in the other direction. Okay, all right. What if, what if we again have a three-dimensional coordinate system, and inside of it, floating somehow at a certain attitude, is a parallelogram. A parallelogram with one of the sides is x, one of the sides is y, and when viewed from the top anyway, it would appear to us that it has counterclockwise orientation. Now we can compute the, the, the unsigned area. We can compute the area of this. Its area is the square root of the determinant of xy transpose xy. And notice that this is unsigned. That is to say, it's not able to provide us with, for example, a negative result. OK. I have a question. Is this what I'm about to write? Is this what I'm writing defined? Because this is how we found the unsigned area of a parallelogram, the, sorry, the signed area of a parallelogram on the previous page. Is this defined? No, no it is not. Why is this not defined? This is a this is a three by two matrix. How many columns? Uh, two columns? Two columns, x and y. But then, how many components do x and y have each? Three. Three, right? So this matrix is three by two. It's not square. So that means this is not even defined. It's just not defined. You can't you can't do it. Okay. Now, the intuitive sense of why that should be the case is, again, I'd like for you to imagine that you were, you were looking at this parallelogram, which I hope you can imagine is like, 
you know, sitting at an angle or something in three space. We could, you know, wiggle it around. Yeah, it, it would, if I could draw a shadow, I would. Okay, but I won't even attempt. If you look at it from this side, if you look at it from this side, then it appears to have counterclockwise orientation. But if you float around and look at it from the other side, from the underside, it appears to have the other orientation. So you can't, you can't assign this uh, as having an orientation. You can't do it. This is, algebraically, this is, this is the reason why you can't do it. This, this is one of the manifestations of, of the reason why you can't do it. Okay, so one-dimensional objects have a one-dimensional size, but it's, un, but it's unsigned. Two-dimensional objects have a two-dimensional size, but they're unsigned. What about three-dimensional objects? They have a three-dimensional size. I'm talking about like cubes and, and, and things like that. They have a three-dimensional size that, that's unsigned, of course. Do they have a signed three-dimensional size in, in R3? They do. They do. Because here is the standard orientation in R3. So you, you stack the, the basis vectors and you do them head to tail. First the first one, then the second one, then the third one. So here's the first one, E1. Then you do the second one, which is, which is going in what direction? To the right. Okay, then you do the third one, which is going up. <coughs> now, if you sort of complete this, just like what I mean is, when I drew this first x, then y, I said, now complete the parallelogram. Okay, now I'm going to complete the three-dimensional parallelogram, which is going to be the unit box the unit cube. Okay, so it would look like this. Okay, so it has, it's a box. You first trace out this edge, then that edge, then that edge. Okay, just like, just like, uh, the orientation of a line segment is, is given as an arrowhead, and the orientation of a parallelogram is given as a swirl. The orientation of little three-dimensional pieces also has their own little symbol thingy. Okay, and here it is. I've run out of colors. Okay, so we'll take, we'll take the first two, and notice that down here, if we just take the first two, that would give us a swirl going in this direction. If we just take red and green, E1 and E2, okay, then the way that you finish it is you say, okay, it's swirling this way and going up. So that's a little busy, so I'll take it over here and draw it so you can see it a little better. So now I'd like for you to imagine grabbing that vertical line segment with your right hand with your right hand uh, and with your thumb pointed up, do you see that your fingers would go in the same direction as that swirl? This is the right-handed orientation, the, the symbol for right-handed orientation in a three-dimensional space. Okay, what is going to be the symbol for left-handed orientation in a three-dimensional space? So this is the positive orientation. The negative orientation will be the symbol for it will be this. Okay, now, just to, just to uh, settle your fears that maybe something's a little bit off, again, I'd like for you to look at the, at the positive orientation and imagine 
uh, putting your thumb in the direction of the vertical line, pointing in the same direction. Do you, does your right hand agree with the, cur with the curl of it? It does. But what if I turn the page upside down? Does it still agree? It does, it does right? Of course it does. Okay. It must. It must because if it didn't, that would be saying that we could walk around somewhere to some other place on the earth and then suddenly what was your right hand would be your left. <laughs> oh, okay, a mirror. But, but a mirror, a mirror revert, but you can't walk through the mirror, right? Last I checked. Okay, so, so we could construct, we could construct a parallelopiped, that is to say a three-dimensional parallelogram by taking three vectors. So I want to do that. <coughs> Suppose we do that, where we, where we have, uh, say, first we travel a little bit in the x direction, then we travel a little bit, and I don't mean x as in the first coordinate direction, I mean, uh, I just mean there's a vector named x. And then we have a vector named y. And then we have a vector named z. So something like, oh man, that might be the best I can do. Now let's see, <laughs> let's see if I can draw a, uh, a three-dimensional parallelogram. Okay, here we go. We can see that one. Okay, and then this one, that way, something like this. Oh, this is a disaster. Oh, man. Okay, so that one is like there. This one goes up. We can see it. That one goes that way. We can see it. We can see that one. We can see that one. Okay, so I hope you take my meaning. Okay, a three-dimensional parallelogram. It would be like a it would be like a a box, like a packing box, but we leaned it over a little bit, and so it's slanty now. Okay, and we want to know we want to know the volume, the volume of this of this parallelopiped, the unsigned volume. Okay, so then the unsigned volume. is going to be what? The square, the, square, the square root of the determinant of how much? XYZ transpose. XYZ transpose. XYZ transpose and, and then XYZ again. Like so. So what I want you to see is that this formula is, is going to continue as far as you like. So if you, if you had two vectors in R2451, high dimensional space, then, there, then there could, there, you can make a two dimensional parallelogram. And it has a two dimensional area, but it doesn't have an oriented area. Not in, not in space 2451. Okay. And you could do it just like this. Okay, what is the signed volume of, of this? Determinant of x, y, z. Signed volume is just determinant of the matrix with columns x, y, z. Interesting. Interesting. So, one thing is that if you were to take this formula and simplify it, so, so understanding that this is the formula for the signed volume of that shape, that's the formula for the signed volume. If you were to simplify this, what would you get if you simplified it as much as conceivably possible? You'd get absolute value of that. That's what you'd get. 
That's what you'd get, absolute value of that. But if you were to attempt a similar thing with this formula, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. Because at any rate, this is, this is not a square matrix. Okay, because it's uh, three by two. Interesting. So if it happens, if it so happens that you compute the determinant of x, y, z, and you get a negative value, that means that if you were to draw, if you were to draw the corresponding three-dimensional parallelogram and produce its orientation, what orientation would it give you? A left-handed orientation. And if you compute this determinant and get a positive value, that means that if you were to draw the oriented version of this three-dimensional parallelogram, you would get a right-handed orientation. Yes? So what's the point of the other side volume? You just the side volume and the So I'll answer your question with a counter question. My counter question to you is, under what circumstances can you have a signed, can, can you have a signed measure? So for example, we were able to have a signed measure of things on the line, somehow. We are able to have a signed measure of things in the plane. We're able to have a signed measure of things in three space. Under what circumstance? When the are same as the space. Exactly. When the number of vectors for example, here we have three, x, y, and z, when the number of vectors is the same as the dimension of the space. So if we found ourselves in 13-dimensional space, then we could talk about a 13-dimensional parallelogram. And it could have assigned content, assigned measure. Could, could a 12-dimensional parallelogram sitting inside of a 13-dimensional space have assigned measure? It could not, for the same reason that those other ones couldn't, because you could walk around to the other side. So, did my counter question answer it? Okay, good. Because it's not always possible for, for every kind of parallelogram for, for a given space. Good. Any other questions about this? Now, the reason why, why I've taken the time to do this so carefully, so very carefully, is I'd like to remind you, just briefly, of uh, the fact that all of you have to do a an oral exam, right? Do you remember that? I haven't set the sign up yet, but I will. And one of the, one of the oral exams is the fundamental theorem of calculus. And the fundamental theorem of calculus, at least the way that I presented it, was proven in three phases. And one of the phases, one of the phases, you had taken the line, an interval, which is, which is oriented to the right, because, because we're always orienting to the right in such, in such things. And we took a partition, we took a partition of points, so I'll say that we just have five of them. And there's part of that argument was that we're going to construe this one as being negative, and this one is being negative, and this one is being negative, and this one is being negative. And then we're also going to construe this one as being positive, this one is being positive, this one is being positive, and this one is being positive. So do you remember that part of the argument where we were adding and subtracting all the things? So if you, whatever this quantity here, whatever it is, if it was a seven, if you added it and then subtracted it, it would cancel out, whatever that quantity is. So after you perform that cancellation, all those cancellations, what you're left with what you're left with is just these two points. And how, how is that relevant for the fundamental theorem? Be because the right-hand side of the fundamental theorem says that an integral can be evaluated 
by evaluating the antiderivative at two positions, construing this one as positive and that one as negative. Okay, so what we're going to do with all these little oriented pieces, with all these little oriented pieces is, for example, we're going to take a square. We'll take a square and then we'll partition it. But each one of the little partitions needs to have, needs to have an orientation. So we'll give them all an orientation. We'll give them the underlying orientation of the space. They're all counterclockwise. I drew too many of them. I should have just drawn four. In fact, I'm, I'm just going to do it. So you can imagine I finished that. So they're all counterclockwise. Which means that, which means that from viewing this particular square and this one alone and ignoring all the other stuff, what is the orientation of that edge? Down, right? It's pointing down. So just viewing that bottom right square, its left edge is pointing down. Down. And its right edge is pointing, uh, its bottom edge is pointing to the right, and this one up, and this one left. Okay, now, how about ignoring all of them but the, but the top right? How are its edges going to be oriented? How is this one oriented right here, just viewing the, from the top? It's going to the right. How about the others? I'll just do them quickly. So what's going to be the upshot? Can anyone see it? Yeah, look. Look at this edge right here. It's being counted both in one sense and in its opposite sense. So the internal edges are all going to cancel. And after you cancel all internal edges, what's left? Just the outside. After you cancel all the stuff inside, what's left? Just the outside. So in order to do this inside-outside game, in order to play this inside-outside game, we have to be able to break objects into parallelograms that have an orientation. Okay? So I can't really, that, that's, I want to just put that in your head so that it's in there, but we can't really talk about it much more here at this position. Okay, good. <clears throat> Good, 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 good. So we all know how to do determinants, three by three determinants, right? That's some, that was from linear algebra. Yes? So I won't even bother. Uh, good. We have this other thing now. I guess we do have something called cross product. Okay, let's, <laughs> let's, write, it, let's write it down. So in the first place, In the first place, cross product is only defined in exactly one Rn. Which one? R3. It is defined exactly and only in R3. So suppose that we have x equal to x1, x2, x3, and y equal to y1, y2, y3, and of course both of those are in R3. Then just like we had the dot product, in, in which dimensions is the dot product defined? All of them, right? It's defined in all of them. You can do it in R3, you can do it in R33 uh, and, and R2451, right? All of them. So you can, here's a new product. Here's a new product, but it is only defined in dimension 3. It is called the cross product. It is denoted with a cross, so that's 
more than just a good name, right? The cross product, the definition, is the following. So it is the determinant. So notice, notice that this is going to be the, I'm, I'm writing the first component. I'm writing the first component, component number one of the cross product. And what's going to happen is this is going to be the determinant of some two by two matrix. It's going to be the determinant of a two by two matrix and we're going to leave out all the component ones because it's in position one. We're only going to use component two. Z. It'll be, uh, what will it be? <laughs> It'll be x2, x3, y2, y3. The determinant of this one. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, next. This is de the next one will also be the determinant of a two by two matrix. Which, which um, position are we in? Second. We're in the second position. Which means that we're only going, because when we were in the first position, position one, we only used indices two and three. When we're in position two, we're only going to use which indices? <laughs> just a moment, just a moment. Which, so which ones? One and three. So now it will be x3, x1, uh, y3, y1. So I just did something that you might consider to be weird, but I'll explain it in a moment. <clears throat> so notice that we only, in position, in the second position, we only used one and three. In the third position, it's still a determinant of a two by two matrix. So in the third position, we'll only use indices what? One and two. So it'll be x1, x2, y1, y2. Okay, so now someone say it. What's the weird thing that I did? Right, okay, so then probably, probably, the way that you're accustomed to seeing this is where the first, the, 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 the first and third are in agreement with each other. So the determinant of x2, x3, uh, y2, y3, we all agree with that one, that one's good. And then this one is negated to where it's det negative determinant of x1, x3, y1, y3. And then this one is, again, the same determinant of x1, x2, uh, y1, y2. So probably, probably you're accustomed to seeing it in that way. So why did I, then, then why did I do it in this other way? Okay, okay. So if, if we ignore all of the geometry for a moment, uh, do you recall what happens if you swap two columns or two rows of a determinant? Sign. It changes sign. Of course, you can, you can understand that now because what, is that, what does it mean to do that? Uh, what, what does it mean? It, it's, saying, it's saying don't do x first then y. It's saying do, do y first and then x. So you're swapping the orientation of that parallelogram. So it has the, the opposite sense of area. Okay. So the reason to do this, the reason to do this is that, the, the reason to consider it this way is that the dimensions go in the, go in the order one and then two and then three. And okay, that's the order in which they are traversed. The order in which they are traversed. And, you, and if we take the rule that you're only allowed to move to your neighbor, and you, have to tr and you have to travel the shortest direction. So for example, if three wanted to go to one, then there's a loop that goes back around this way and does this. So if three wanted to go to one, it, it wouldn't travel by way of two. It wouldn't go this way, it would go that way. Similarly, if two wanted to travel to one, it would go that way. It would go to the left. But what I want you to see is that this is the positive direction, positive and these other ones are the negative direction. If you travel f from one to three, one to three, and you have to travel the shortest one, the one with the least amount of arcs, 
then you have to travel this one. You have to travel this one. It's negated. Or if you like, it might, it might look better like this. One, two, three. If you travel one to three, then you're traveling in the negative direction. That's why this negative is here. But if you travel three to one, <coughs> pardon me, three to one, that's the positive direction. That's why this is positive. Okay, so however you want to remember this formula, that's fine. <coughs> now there's three things about the geometry of the cross product that we have to know. So this is, this is sort of, we'll, we'll take this as the definition of the cross product, uh, but, but I'd like for you to know that there's, there's a, a, a completely geometric way to understand the cross product. Okay, so let's, ri let's write down uh, those things. Let x and y be elements of R3. <clears throat> then we want, we'll, we'll observe, since that's the definition of the cross product, observe that x cross y <coughs> must have the following properties. So in the first place, x, x cross y is another vector in R3. It's another vector. And it is the case that x cross y is orthogonal to x, that is at a right angle to x, and it is also at a right angle to y. It has to be, it has to be at a right angle to both of them, okay, which, which algebraically could be written like this. So x cross y is perpendicular to x and x cross y is perpendicular to y. And then as a matter of drawing, as a matter of drawing, we could say, okay, well, if this is x, if x looks like this, <coughs> and y, we put y's tail with x's tail like this, then what that first rule is saying what that first rule is saying is that the cross product must fall on this line because those are all the vectors that are orthogonal to both x and y or if you like orthogonal to the plane spanned by x and y <coughs> so 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 far we know it's got to be like that okay the second requirement of the cross product the second requirement of the cross product is that its length Its length is what? It's equal, it's equal to the area of that parallelogram. This is the area of this parallelogram. And of course, am I talking about area or unsigned area? Area. Uh, or sorry, am I talking about the one with sign or the one without sign? Without sign. Without sign. It has to be without because the length, because what kind of thing is, am I putting inside of there? What kind of thing is that? That's an R3, right? That's a, that's a three-dimensional vector. And this is talking about its length, which is, of course, un, unsigned. Okay, so what that tells us, taking these two together, taking those two together, what we've established is that if this is, if this is y and this is x, then the first requirement is saying that the cross product has to fall on this line that's the first requirement. The second requirement is saying that there's only two possible places where it's allowed to fall. What two places could it possibly fall? Of 
Right. We need to travel from, from where all these tails join. We need to travel either this way, the length, the area of that parallel, parallelogram, or the other way. Either, either the one way or the other. So it's, it's either this one, it might be this one, it might be this one. It's one of these. So it's either that one or that one. There's one more rule that tells you which, which, which one is the right one. So what is it? The right hand rule. Okay, the right hand rule says that three, the, the parallelopiped, the, the three parallelogram that is given by first x, then y, then x cross y, must be right-handed. Which is to say, if you were to draw the parallelogram that has one side x, and then, and then next, uh, not side, but edge, one edge x, and then next edge y, and then next edge x cross y, it has to give you a positive orientation. So, which one is the right one in this picture? The one going up, right? Because, at least to me, it looks like x to y, and then this way. x to y, up. Okay, so that's enough to, to say what the, what the cross product is. Good, any questions about this? Yes? It is. Could we not follow the same procedure of arranging the determinants and like increasing, incrementing which, which uh, elements that were determinating at the same time? Like, can we, can we just apply that to another? So, so I th th let, me, let me try and put some words in your mouth. What, what if, what if, okay, uh, what if we had four dimensional vectors and then we wanted to use three by three, three, by three determinants? then we'd need three, vec three vectors for our product, right? That's not going to work. Right? Because you'd need to have three columns, and then you need to delete one row. It won't work. Now, there is something kind of like the cross product in dimension seven. <laughs> but we're not going to talk about it. It is not arbitrary. It is, it is, in a sense, a fact of the universe. That's it. The only things that are so like the cross product three and seven are just, that's it. it. Is there two, three, and seven? The, the seven thing, I have no idea. No physical thing that I know of. Yes? Uh, is there any reason why there can't be another one in some arbitrarily high dimension that we just haven't found yet? Okay, so then I'll, as your friendly neighborhood mathematician, I'll tell you that there are no other cases, and the reason has to do with, with uh, abstract algebra. Is that you, you can't get it you can't get it to work. So so we what what kind of things do we like about do we like to have about products? So we, we like them to um, to for example uh, distribute. Right? That is to say a multiplied by sum of b plus c, it should distribute. Okay, the dot product the dot product distributes the cross product distributes. Terrific. Okay, another thing that we like to know is about their commutivity. Now, what does that mean? Yeah, if you swap them, right? So like three times five is five times three. That's because, that's because product in the reals commutes. How about the dot product, does it commute? Dot, the dot product. Does the dot product commute? It does, it does. That means that, 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 means that x dot y is the same as y dot x. Does the cross product commute? No. It negates. When you commute, it negates. The reason is it can be seen quite simply in this formula, and that is if you commuted x and y, literally all these x's and all those y's would swap. So it's just you swap all the columns and all those little determinants, and every one of them is negated. OK, so, so the cross product is, is said to be anti-commutative. It anti-commutes. And that's a perfectly legitimate thing. Anti-commutivity is, is, for mathematicians, just as good as commutivity, as, as far as neatness of the math is concerned. 
Okay, but here's the real problem with the dot product. Here's the real problem with the dot product. Uh, if we have x dot y, what kind of thing is x? Scalar or vector? It's a vector. And then what kind of thing is y? It's a vector. So we take these two vectors and combine them with dot product and get what kind of thing? A scalar. This is a problem. This is, this is a problem because, because human beings love and understand situations in which you combine two things of the same type and get a third thing of the same type, right? You take two real numbers, you add them, you get a real. You take two real numbers, you multiply them, you get a real. You take two vectors and product them with dot product and you get a scalar. Oh no, right? The type changed, right? That would be like taking two cats, combining them and getting dogs or something, right? That's not the way it works. That's upsetting. Yes? Uh, and this is just me being curious for that. I always thought the dot product and cross product that are dot product being the magnitude of parallelness between the two uh, vectors and the cross being the magnitude of... Uh, their orthogonality, uh, a yeah, measure of their exactly. orthogonality. That, that's, a, that's a good measure in the same sense that sine and cosine are measures of the same thing. This is true. Uh, so, uh, here, here's, here's another thing. How about, uh, what if you square a non-zero real? For example, what if you square three? You get nine, right? You're not gonna get zero, right? What's the only number that squares to zero? Zero. zero. And in particular, if you multiply two non-zero reals, for example, like three and five, can you get zero? What if you have the product of two reals that is, and the product is zero? What must be true? At least one of them was zero. Is that true with the dot product? What, what kind of vectors could you dot product and then get zero? Orthogonal ones. The dot product of orthogonal vectors is zero. So you could take two vectors, neither of which has length zero, but then you compute their product and you get zero. That's scary. Okay, what about, what about the cross product? Could you possibly take two non-zero vectors, cross product them, and get something that's zero? Yes. Yeah. If they're parallel. Why, why, do parallel, why do parallel vectors have a, parallel three-dimensional vectors have a zero cross product? Because it's the area of a, of a, of a trivialized parallelogram. Imagine two collinear vectors. Now draw the parallelogram. How much two-dimensional area is there? None, right? So, so the product of parallel vectors is, is uh, the cross product of parallel vectors is zero. Zero vector or zero scalar? Zero vector, right? Okay, finally, the last thing that we really, really want to have for, for products is associativity, which is to say A times B times C can be associated as AB times C or A times BC as associativity. In the first place, associativity for the dot product doesn't even make sense. It doesn't even make sense. Okay, because X dot Y dot Z doesn't even make sense because once you evaluate one of them, that pair becomes a scalar. And you can't dot a vector with a scalar. So it doesn't even make sense for dot product. It does make sense for cross product, but is the cross product associative? It is not. It is not associative. So, one of your exercises will be to show that it's not. Finally, while I'm railing on, on the cross product, I'd like for you to observe the following. And that is that, suppose we're in, we're in R3, and this is X. Are we running out of time? No, we still have time. This is x, and this is y, and we're in R3. Then, viewed from the top, this parallelogram has this orientation. And I'd like for you to, uh, I'd like for you to imagine that right here, I put a mirror. So this is a mirror. Mirror. 
And I want you to draw what this parallelogram would see on the other side of that mirror. Well, you'd see a red X. This one is pointing up and to the right, but how would, how would its partner on the other side be pointing? Up and to the left. And how would Y be pointing? Notice that Y is just barely at, you know, tilted toward the mirror. So it would still be tilted toward the mirror on the other side. So it would look like this. And this is all, of course, up to my ability to draw. Okay, and then what would the orientation of this be? And notably, it would be the opposite of that one. Of course, that makes sense because imagine yourself looking at a, at a, at a full-length mirror and hold up your right hand in, in your imagination and your, your partner in the mirror, what hand are they holding up? Their left hand. So it makes good sense that, that the orientation of this one in the mirror would be reversed. Now I want you to do, now I want you to do the same experiment where this is x and this is y. Okay, so uh, in, my, in my head, I'm imagining like this, that this one is x cross y. So x cross y is kind of doing that. So x and then y and x cross y. Now I want you to draw the mirror. I want you to draw the mirror. And I want you to draw x and I want you to draw y first. Draw x and y. <laughs> draw x and y. So x would look like this, ish. And y like this. And now I want you to, for this x and y, I, <laughs> I want you to, what will x cross y look like for this x and y? It's going down. <laughs> it's going down, isn't it? That's not good. That's not good at all. Okay, so this, is, this right here is the big problem with, with cross product, is that it is, it is, it is misbehaved under reflection. And that's why we're not going to talk about cross product anymore this semester because it's a piece of junk. <laughs> <clears throat> so rather what we're going to do is I'll try to inform you of how math has moved on from cross products. Okay? And we'll, we'll do the other mathematical tools that don't have this hang up and I'll show you how it relates to cross products. Yes? Okay, okay, now I have a different question then. Suppose that, suppose that this is the direction of the magnetic field going this way. Then that means that the electric field is going this way, right? Now flip, flip its companion over here. You would want this vector to still be going up but it won't be going up. It'll be going down. So as a result, these things are not actually vectors. In, in physics, they're, they're called pseudo vectors for you physics majors. All right, have a nice Thursday. See you next time. <laughs>